Greetings, everyone. Uh, by the way, let me just start by saying that this is not my joke. Okay, I, I've asked ChatGPT for it as an icebreaker. I've asked multiple times. This was the best I could get. I know it's not good, but it kind of makes the point. We are going to be talking about security in distributed containers. So before we get to that, just for you to get to know me, my name is Cristóvão Cordeiro. It's quite a mouthful, so you can just call me Chris. I'm an engineering manager at Canonical. I've been doing cloud and edge computing for quite some time now. And for the past few years, I've been doing more and more around containers. And the thing that I got puzzled with and why we are talking about this is that there's a, like a common shift towards distributed containers. And I don't know how many of you here actually know what distributed containers are, can I get a raise of hand, like a few people? All right, so that's good, that sets the ground, but there's a sort of misconception around security and distributed, and that's the thing we are going to cover today. And it's mostly because the foundation uh, between what people select, what people think about when selecting a container, like if you are pulling something, or pulling an image from Docker Hub or ECR or ACR, Usually people tend to think about security. That's their topmost concern is that if I'm going to pull something out of there, whether it's distributed or not, I want to make sure that that thing will not compromise my production infrastructure, right? If I put it, run it somewhere, it should not become a liability. So that's the topic today. It's let's look at distributed containers and how, if you don't do them right, they can become a sort of security abyss, they can become like a, a black hole for hidden vulnerabilities. Now, there's this very cool study that, uh, well, it's actually a report, and I'm kind of using a few numbers from that report. It's from Resilient, you will find the, the link down there. And they have done something quite nice, which is they have performed a study about scanning the scanners, right? As you know, for container images, uh, it's very common that we will use third-party third tools to kind of scan an image to know if there are vulnerabilities inside that image. The thing is, you are trusting a tool to tell you whether your container is secure or not. So these guys kind of, they did a whole study, they picked up a few scanners and kind of tried to assess how they behave when scanning images. And one of the cool numbers that I found interesting for people that might be thinking of oh, vulnerabilities, as long as I have the latest and greatest base image, if it is secure, my image will be secure and I can just sleep tight for the next few months or whatever. In 2021, there were more than 20,000 vulnerabilities added to the database. That's a lot. And the study itself, the report, what it did was, first, they cherry-picked 20 of the most popular container images. I think it was in Docker Hub. Then they cherry-picked nameless, to avoid any bias or pointing fingers, but nameless uh, tools, six vulnerability scanners, which, by the way, when scanning those 20 images, they all reported different results. That's, that's already a good start. Then they actually found that throughout all the results, there were more than 450 vulnerabilities that were high and critical that were misidentified. Now, misidentified can either mean that the scanners said that there was a CV when there wasn't, or the opposite, they said that everything was okay when it wasn't. So, and the latter is what I call, what they call false negatives. One of those tools actually reported more than 16 false negatives per container that it scans. I mean, this is like, just think about it. It's like if you have a container and the scanner is saying everything is fine, when in fact you have 16 vulnerabilities inside. Putting all together, the report says that 82% average precision for all the scanners, which means 80% of the results were false positives. So 18% of the results were basically saying there's something there when in fact there wasn't, okay? To be honest, we can live with this, right? It's bad, right? It kind of misrepresents your container image, but you know that your container does not have that CVE, so that's fine. 
What's worse is a false negative, right? That's the hidden vulnerability. And 70% of the results, around 73% of the results, uh, amounted to the actual reality, which means the rest were unidentified. And that's what's bad. So why did we get these results? Or why did the report uh, showcase these results? So their conclusion is that first, there is variance in the scanners. So not all scanners support the same ecosystem. Some scanners might have better support for things like Golang or Rust and others don't. So right there you have a discrepancy. Then there's also a question about the surrounding environment. Let's not go too much into this because yes, it matters where you build and where you run the container. Because since the container is sharing the kernel from the host, if the host is compromised, what does that mean about the container? But let's move on. One important thing is also context, right? Let's say you have an application. Your application most likely will require some sort of configuration. So a CVE sometimes might only exist under certain conditions. And what these tools and scanners will actually say is that, do you have that application? Therefore, you have a CVE. When in fact, the way you are running that application might not actually be exposing your container to anything. Then we have false positives, which are commonly uh, driven by the use of CP, which is a common notation to identify the software and versions. Uh, and they use this as a sole identifier. The thing is that this identifier can be quite limiting. And again, it can cause the scanners to say, oh, do you have that? I can see that package has vulnerabilities, therefore you have vulnerabilities. And again, they are ignoring context and the surrounding environments. But the one I want to talk about is actually the last one, which is the ability to detect software that is not managed by package managers, right? So the thing here is that uh, when we get into distros, for those who, who know it, and for those who don't, I'll just give you a quick definition in a, in a couple of minutes. If you don't have a package manager, you might be missing the necessary metadata and necessary context for some scanners to know what you have inside the image. I know it sounds weird. Like what we are saying is that, right, so the scanners are trusting the developers to tell them what to do. Surprisingly enough, that's the case for most scanners. I can give you an example. I could have a container image today that has 10 CVs, and with a single line, I can make a scanner believe that I have zero vulnerabilities. How? I'll just massage the dpackage metadata, because those scanners will just look into the dpackage status file to get the list of packages I have installed, and infer which ones have CVs. So I can very easily lie, okay? So the whole thing, and this is why we are talking about distros, is that distros typically does not use package managers because we want to keep those images super small. So the way we build things is a bit different. So these kind of patterns can be identified. And the same report, well, actually a different report of the same study went through the, uh, GitHub, actually, not Docker Hub, GitHub, and tried to find Docker files with those patterns. And it actually found over 100,000 Docker files with behaviors that are very, very, very prone to result in hidden vulnerabilities. So the problem here, and the reason I'm focusing on false negatives is because it gives you a, fa a false sense of security. You cannot know what you don't know, and therefore you cannot fix what you don't know, right? And again, this is very common in distros. Why? Because the usual practice is that you will go from top down. You will start with a bigger image. Sometimes you are even taking a base image that already has vulnerabilities. And then you add your software from different places, remote places, local folders, whatever, things you cannot really trace. And then you end up cherry picking certain contents into a scratch image without any package managers. And you do this manually, right? When you cherry pick something manually, it's kind of, it's a recipe for disaster because it's very likely that you will forget to copy one file or a configuration file or the metadata required for the scanners to know what you are packing inside that image. So I like to call this a sort of the, uh, 
the, the fallacy of complacent distributed containers. Like, if, if it ain't broke, I won't fix it, right? If everything is working just fine, then everything must be fine. And if my container is smaller, then I must have less vulnerabilities. Therefore, if I'm distributed, I'm secure, which is not the case. So for those who actually don't know what distributed is, and I'm using a quote here from Google's uh, GitHub repository, they have a portfolio of distributed images. It's basically the concept of building container images with just your application and its runtime dependencies, just that. So you do not have package managers, which is fine. You don't want package managers at runtime, but you might want them to build the image. And you also don't have the utilities at runtime that you would usually find in a distro image. So you don't have things like APT, you don't have uh, Veeam, you don't have curl, and so on. You don't need those, so why risk yourself? So, Distrilus is great. I'm not trying to bash on, on Distrilus, uh, but it's only great if you do it right. And yes, there are an excellent alternative to have, instead of having bloated distro images or even small distro images, it's still better to just only have what you need for your application, but it can become a, a difficult practice, right? There are specialized tools to help you do distros, but they can be hard. Some people use very complex multi-stage builds to do this cherry picking and installing, growing an image and then trimming it down. It's a complex process and it's top down and it might require a lot of distro knowledge. Think about it. If you have an application, you are the expert about that application. However, your application has dependencies. So if you are going to cherry pick those dependencies, you need to know what you are cherry picking, which means you need to know what are the devs you depend on and how are they composed, what libraries you need to fetch and cherry pick. So it becomes a very time consuming exercise and you must know a lot about the things you are bringing into your image. So the, the, the idea here is trying to make distrolus a sort of distroful experience, right? making distros as if it was from a distro. So combining the best, the best of both worlds such that we can use a package manager to build the image. That's, that would be nice because then we can profit from um, the, all the metadata that the package manager will bring and we can use the package manager to abstract all the things we don't know about the packages that we depend on. Keep it simple, keep it familiar, ensure provenance, right? It's, Distrolus, but I still want to rely on a well-trusted base, right? Not some third-party image that I have found in the dark corner of the world. It's something I trust. So it's also stable and supported, has some SLAs and support commitments. And I want to build it from the ground up. All of these cherry picking and bloating images and trimming them down, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive. But keep it Distrolus. So this is where Chisel came to be. This is something that is developed. It's being developed, it already exists. Uh, you can use it today. It's from Canonical. And as the name says, it is a tool that you can use to kind of sculpt ultra small Ubuntu images. The way it works is that it relies on the Ubuntu archives. So when, when you are using Chisel, you are actually installing things from the archives. And I call them things because you are not actually installing packages, not the whole packages. You are installing slices. Slices are portions of a Debian package that are predefined in a declarative way, and Chisel knows about those definitions. So if the package maintainer has said that, well, for my package foo, I have a set of binaries, I have a set of man pages, I have some uh, configuration files, and he decides to split that into two, three different slices. That means that at build time, which is all you can say, I only want that slice, leave everything else out because I don't need it. It can only bring me problems and vulnerabilities, okay? So the bigger picture kind of looks like this. You can start from the Ubuntu distribution that you know, but the ultimate goal is to use a package manager or some sort of a package manager, in this case, Chisel, to get from those necessary packages, from that distro, only the bits and pieces that you actually know, only those slices. 
And very much like any other package manager, those slices can have dependencies between them. They can have scripts as well to kind of try to reproduce the maintainer scripts from Debian packages. So apt installs Debian packages, chisel installs Debian package slices. I'll give you an example here. Let's take the base password Debian package. If you don't know it, it's where you would get your etc password and etc group files from if you want to do uh, user management. So the Debian actually has 17 files, two dependencies, and when you install it, it is around 250 kilobytes of size. On the right side of the screen, you will see what we call a slice definition file. This is the YAML where the package maintainer or any other contributor, this is a community effort, can go and define slices for that package. So there is the data, we call it the data slice. What's inside the data slice? I only need the group and password files because for my container, I only need to add a non-root user. And so I just need a way for the system to understand what that user is and what group it belongs to. I don't need anything else, right? So we went from 17 files to a functional slice that has two files, zero dependencies, and 40 kilobytes of size when installed. So yeah, you actually don't need it, but this is depending on your use case. Sometimes you might need more, sometimes you might need less. And that's why slices are kind of ever growing. You can add as many slices as you want. These are not set in stone. Today we have data, tomorrow you might have another slice called config, or you might have another slice called just user. You just want the user password file for some reason, okay? So the point here is that we want to achieve that nice experience that we talked about before, and do it from the ground up, bottom up, right? And keep it distributed. So we want to use a package manager. In this case, let it be Chisel. Simple and familiar. This is a one-liner, right? It's, if you want to know how to use Chisel, it's just Chisel cuts. You specify an empty folder where to install your stuff from the ground up. There's nothing inside that folder. And then you specify the slices that you want to install. That's it. This will construct a file system in this folder, and then you can just copy that file system into a scratch image, and you have a distributed Ubuntu image. So yeah, it's Ubuntu, so provenance is ensured, stable and secured, it's supported, so you get the same SLAs, the same commitments, and from the ground up, as we just saw with the minus minus root option, you get to a, an empty folder. It can have something inside, so you can actually overlay. You can run Chisel twice and keep building your system, which is a nice thing. But typically, you can start from nothing and just start installing slices into that folder. I will leave this. Uh, I still have a few minutes, so I actually can go through this right now. I'm just giving an example uh, of how you can do this if you want to try it. Uh, I'm doing it with a Docker file. I'm using Jammy as a base. Why as a base? So for now, you will still need to get Chisel into your build, right? Today, we are distributing Chisel uh, as uh, a snap, but also in a GitHub release, uh, you will find the binary there. This is what I'm doing here. I'm basically getting the, the binary from the GitHub release. Uh, this experience can be improved and might be in the future. We might think about uh, shipping Chisel also as a container image, which would be nice, because in this case, you wouldn't need any more to fetch it, you wouldn't need to set CA certificates because Chisel needs that in order to speak with the archives. So, but this is the same for any Chisel image that you want to do. You need to get Chisel, prepare the ground for it. And then here we are creating that Chisel Ubuntu empty directory. And let's install the hello beans slice. So it's the hello package. I don't need man pages, I just want the binary. And the slice itself already has the dependencies it needs, like cliffc 6 for the binary to be executed. That's all I need. Then from scratch, I'll copy the entire folder, that's my file system basically, into the scratch image. My entry point will be the hello binary. I'll build it here. 
well, this is recorded, so it should not take that long. I'm not using our network here. Thank Lord. This is Chisel running, so I, I decided to keep the cache, uh, to, to use no cache, just so you could see the Chisel logs they are fetching from the archives. And now that I have that image, I can just run it. The hello world as expected, and it's five megabytes, right? This is five megabytes decompressed. It's the size on the file system. So if I were to push this image to like Docker Hub, it would be compressed to an even smaller size. So I'm about to wrap up, and I just wanted to say that this is all very pretty. I, I know, well, I work at Canonical. I've been working in the development and conception of Chisel. I don't want to make it sound like I'm selling snake oil or something. There's no such thing as free lunch, if you were wondering what that meant. Uh, you will still need to choose a scanner that fits your purpose. Right. There are still things that Chisel will not do for you. Right. Chisel will get you those packages slices, but what about your application? You'll still need to compile your application, maybe bring some additional dependencies from your own repositories. That's fine, but just make sure you choose a scanner that accounts for those. And avoid dead drops. Sometimes it's not possible, but very often you can do it without kind of dropping something from a remote place that has no way for us to keep trace of and therefore scanners will have no way of knowing whether that specific content has a CV or not. So just avoid dead drops, try to build things through the official channels, devs or packaging um, processes that have proper uh, provenance and proper tracing that scanners can, can look into. And if you cannot, always avoid dead drops, think about complementing the package manager's metadata such that the scanners know about what's inside your container image, even if it is distroless. So think about shipping an S-bomb with your image. You can construct an S-bomb. And OCI actually supports OCI artifacts. You can now shift additional files, text files, alongside your image and tell those scanners to use the S-bomb instead of trying to infer what's inside your container from its contents. Otherwise, you can also try to massage the metadata that the build system gave you. Like if you have, again, deep package status metadata or some other stuff, try to see if it is complete enough for the scanning tools to pick up on what's inside. Because you cannot always control the scanning tools. Nowadays, for example, things like Docker Hub, they already have embedded security scanning. So it's not you who's running those tools. You cannot choose those tools. They have chose that for you, right? So try to be as complete as you can while being distroless. Try not to forget about security. So if you have to compromise a few kilobytes of data just to make sure that scanners are compatible with your distroless image, just do it. So yeah, if you have any questions, I think we are like 40 seconds. We might have time for one question. I don't know, but if not, you can just find me around or just ping me on social. I don't know if there are any questions. 30 seconds. Yes. 31 seconds. <laughs> what kind of metadata the Chisel tool produces? Yeah, so Chisel, right now, if you want metadata, you would need to use a sort of additional, uh, let's call it a, a wrapper that we have created for it. But we are actually working on a dedicated format. It will create something which is what we call a JSON wall. And we will need scanners to be compatible with that. But we believe that our new format will provide much more detailed information to scanners than your legacy, the package status. It will provide actually at the file level instead of package level information. So yeah, for now, if you want something, there's a link here, you can use this, uh, it's a wrapper tool that will generate the package status for you, but uh, in the future, there will be a dedicated format. Maybe a quick one, all right. Uh, is Chisel compatible with other, form, uh, other images like Debian, for example? So you can run Chisel 
in pretty much anywhere. I don't want to say anywhere, but yeah, she's always just the Golang binary. However, you can only install slices from the Ubuntu archives. So Chisel itself only supports packages and slices from the Ubuntu archives. So yeah, running it anywhere, but it only installs stuff from Ubuntu. Thank you. Awesome, thank you.